Our next presenter is Michael Burrow, and he's the first in our class of chief residents to get a real job. Um, he's going to be staying in town as a, a comprehensive ophthalmologist at Rocky Mountain Eye Associates. So it's really exciting. He's going to be presenting on rain attack. All right, thanks Rav, and thanks Tina for that great presentation. I'm just gonna jump right in to keep us moving and get on to Donnie's presentation, which we're all excited about, so. Uh, so this is a presentation about a 26-year-old man who presented this last summer to the ER for a week of chest pain and headache. He had no known medical history, mostly because he really hadn't seen physicians at all. Um, his mother had hypertension, and so he'd kind of been checking his blood pressure with a home blood pressure cuff, and notes that usually during these symptoms, he has high blood pressure. Uh, on and off headache, chest pain for that week, and noticed that when he checks his blood pressure that it had been in the, quote, two, 200 plus range. As, so naturally, he, he <coughs> takes some of his mother's blood, blood pressure medications and that'll make him feel a little bit better, so then that, that fixes the problem. So that's how they've been managing it for who knows how long. But he checked it today, it was 230 over 150, and since it kind of been going on for a week, they decided to present to the ER. Um, his, his other history, really, we didn't know because, as I said, he really hadn't seen a physician at all. I didn't really get this cartoon, but Dr. Petty was able to explain it to me, so thanks for that. <laughs> um, in the ER, just kind of pertinent positives, ne positives and negatives, he, he obviously right there in red, had a blood pressure of 230 over 150 in both arms, but his neuro exam was normal. He had no vision changes, although he didn't really have his vision checked. Um, and then a few other things, slightly diaphoretic, but normal heart and lung sounds um, and normal neuro exam. So this, I put this in, I, I kind of found this funny, but at the same time, the next slide uh, kind of does, you know, give, give us pause and think this really can affect a young person's life for having this high of a blood pressure for any considerable amount of time. So included in his ER workup, um, he had at least acute kidney injury, if not chronic kidney disease, with a BUN of 26 and a cranium of 1.4. His troponin was even mildly elevated at 20, I mean, he's 26 years old and he had this elevated troponin. His BNP, used in monitoring for heart failure, was very elevated. And then he had other signs of left ventricular enlargement, which suggests that this was a more chronic process. So he was uh, kind of given the diagnosis of hypertensive emergency, which as just a reminder, that is reproducible blood pressure me measurements of 180 over 120 with target and organ damage. So in his case, um, he had heart damage with acute um, heart failure and then also an elevated component and then he also had kidney injury. The other ones, we kind of said no, at least not symptom wise. And then he didn't get an eye exam, so we really didn't get to look at that. He was admitted to the CVICU for IV pre blood pressure management, and then a workup. And then just as a reminder, um, there, there actually are very clear um, and frequently updated guidelines on the management of blood pressure in hypertensive emergency, because there is some permissive hypertension that's allowed so you don't precipitously drop the blood pressure and then actually cause ischemic and organ damage. So this was, this was kind of his goal, uh, 180 systolics of 180 for the first one to two hours, and then 160 over the next six to 12 hours. During his inpatient stay, um, up to when ophthalmology was involved, this was kind of his blood pressure range. So the first couple of days, he was basically right on target. The third day, he maybe dropped a little lower than they would have liked, um, and his lowest was 129 over 89, which is funny because that's, I mean, perfectly normal. But in his case, he did note that he had kind of an episode of blurred vision, but it went away, supposedly. Hospital day four um, was fine, and then hospital day five is when uh, ophthalmology was called kind of late that day. So during morning rounds, there were no complaints on his part. He said everything was fine. But overnight, that night, he had a blood pressure of 108 over 75, which when you're coming from a blood pressure of 230 over 150, I mean, you can imagine, that's just, that's quite the difference. So later that evening, around five or, you know, the witching hour, five or six o'clock, uh, ophthalmology was called and they basically said, you know, our patient says he can't see anything anymore. So um, in discussion with the patient, it was actually a difficult discussion. He, it, he just wasn't giving very clear answers. Um, the inpatient team, even actually when they called me, they said, you know, this is really weird. It, it, you know, we don't think that he's lying, but he's just not being very forthcoming about his answers. And that's kind of the story that I got. So, and I, I agreed when I talked to him, he, you know, he just basically said that, you know, I can't see anything. And when you tried to ask him, when did this happen? He, oh, 
I wasn't sure. And part of it was that he had this headache, so he's trying to sleep most of the day and feels like maybe he woke up and it was like that. But otherwise, no pain, no other neurologic deficits that we could kind of pull out of him with his difficult answers. It was just the vision loss. Uh, so we decided, after, after talking to the team, they did a, an emergent CT uh, head without contrast just to make sure that there wasn't any hemorrhage, uh, cerebral hemorrhage, and there was not. It was read as overall normal. Um, the exam at his uh, inpatient bed, he was no light perception in both eyes, although with like really intense light from the indirect, uh, he did feel like he noted some sense of um, uh, light detection. We're unable to really do any visual field color red DSAT because of that. His pupils were equal and round, and they were actually reactive, like what I would say is normal, and he did not have a relative apparent pupillary defect. Uh, pressures were normal, his extraocular muscles were full, and then his bedside anterior exam was normal. So I cheated a little bit. Obviously, I didn't have pictures with me at bedside. Um, these are pictures taken kind of a day later when we were able to get him to clinic. But I bring this up, I feel like this was a tricky exam, at least for me. Um, so if you'll kind of indulge me and think you're at the bedside inpatient, you don't have the, all the tools you know, kind of readily available. You have this picture in your mind of maybe what might be going on. And I, I thought I had a pretty good idea, and we'll talk about the differential in a minute. But then I do this exam, and his right eye was, was okay. You know, there were kind of some funny kind of pigmentary changes, just not kind of the typical fundus in a 26-year-old. But then the, I got to the left eye, and it, it looked like, you know, he kind of had this really stark, well-defined line of retinal whitening. And it, it kind of tricked me into thinking that, wow, it, is, it, it even feels like it's following this vasculature. So then everything was just thrown off for me. I, I, I said, well, this doesn't make any sense. How can you have someone who's no light perception vision in both eyes? He does not have any pupillary deficits, no relative afferent pupillary defect, but it looks like he's had some sort of vascular occlusion. At least that's what I was saying at the time. So I kind of double checked an exam, tried to really get on the periphery, and you know, this, this wasn't exactly following a branch retinal artery occlusion or anything like that, but it's still, it just wasn't quite normal. It was, it was giving me pause. Um, so just, so I'm gonna keep moving. I, I won't kind of have the residents go out, but maybe the thing to think about or something that's always helpful for me is to think about the differential diagnosis in a structured way. So there's a lot of different ways. Vindicate is one way to kind of go through all the categories. So uh, this, these are some of the things that I thought of going through um, a differential diagnosis and then kind of what were the things that were highest on my list. Now, retinal artery occlusion was not high on my list until I saw that part of the exam, and still it didn't make a lot of sense, and it was going to have to be combined with something, some other process going on. So artery occlusion with a uh, PIO or a press or something like that. And then stroke was on there, and then encephalitis as well. So the immediate workup decision, you know, the inpatient team is basically surrounding me going, what, what do we do next? You know, breathing down my neck. And he, he needed an MRI uh, brain and orbits with and without contrast. But really, if, if he had a CRAO, then we actually talked about this just a couple weeks ago with uh, Dr. Jacobson's presentation. There's a, there's a protocol that you know, we call a brain attack, especially if it's in this acute setting. And that can trigger all sorts of things. And most importantly, probably, is whether or not uh, a patient gets TPA, you know, the administration of TPA. Now, luck, I don't know if I can say luckily, but Luckily for me, that really wasn't a consideration at this point because he was outside of the TPA window, mostly because of his unclear timeline of when this happened. So really the only decision was, well, if we call it brain attack, he's gonna get the imaging really quickly. Um, the neurology team has to kind of rush over and that's maybe an inconvenience for them, but patient safety-wise, that was probably the best thing to happen for the patient. So um, I did actually go ahead and call a brain attack. Uh, and the reasoning was, hey, this looks like it could be a retinal artery occlusion. So we had an emergent MRI done, and then we said, okay, permissive hypertension to kind of the 140 systolic range, and then planned for a MAC OCT and probably a fluorescein angiography when the time allowed. So these are images from his MRI at the time. So this is a T1 post-contrast scan, and you can just see in his uh, occipital lobes here on several slices, you have sulcus enhancement involving bilateral posterior parietal and occipital lobes. Uh, this is a, the window is flare with fat suppression. And again, you can see in these posterior occipital lobes, flare abnormal, signal abnormality or hyperintensities involving those post or bilateral occipital lobes. 
And then a couple of kind of specialty windows. Um, neuroradiology is always really great to go and talk with, so I, I talked with them about this, and they were very um, illuminating on some of these things. So on a GRE, hypointensity on a GRE indicates hemorrhage, which he has just a little bit of right here. And we'll talk about why this is important in a little bit. And then on a DWI and an ADC scan, especially using those two things together, restriction or, or hyperintensity on DWI that correlates with hypointensity on an ADC indicates ischemia. So he kind of has all, he has everything in the posterior occipital lobes. The additional imaging that gets down at the brain attack was normal, and specifically the MRI uh, with orbits with and without, there was no optic nerve enhancement. Oh, sorry. So this is most consistent with a diagnosis of, of PRESS, or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. He was able the next day to transport over to the retina clinic and get an FA, which was normal. It, it, we talked about this. It kind of looks a little blurry out here. It's just mostly because of the, um, and it just wasn't a, the clearest <coughs> picture, but it was normal. Normal arm to retina time, and it was otherwise unremarkable in both eyes. His MAC OCT. He had, a, he had a long or a myopic eye, but otherwise the OCT was normal. And then here's kind of the fuller picture. Like I said, I cheated a little. I kind of shrunk things down. This is obviously an optos picture, um, but this is the full picture. And I think this does a better job of showing that, you know, this, this really fits more with just some kind of pigmentary abnormalities, what we see in things like white without pressure, which I think you, you typically think of in the periphery of the retina, but in this case, it just happened to be in the posterior pole. Okay, so a little bit about posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. I, I don't think this is something that we uh, encounter a lot. In fact, I know it's not because it's just not encountered very lot, very much in the literature. So it's a clinical radiological syndrome. Uh, the symptoms that you can get are headache, seizures, altered mental status, and, and vision loss. And then you have to correlate it with uh, radiologic findings of white matter vasogenic edema, which predominantly affects the posterior parietal or occipital lobes. It was first described in 96, um, but all, anything in the literature are very short case series or case reports, so it really isn't all that common. Age ranges from two to 90 years of age in the literature. It's been known by other names, but this is kind of the widely accepted name at this point is PRESS. And then it's being increasingly diagnosed, but the thoughts are, at least in most of the literature that I found, that this is probably due just to the availability of imaging um, and it's, it's a relatively newly described disease as well, or condition as well. Not all symptoms are present, and then they can vary in their presentation widely. So vision can be mildly blurry to, in this case, bilateral, no light perception vision. It's most often, so it's related to several conditions, and that list is growing, um, but it's most often, by far most often, related to hypertension. Um, but here's kind of a list of other things that, uh, that maybe you can think of as if this is a condition that you're trying to decide, is this gonna be on my differential or not? Importantly, these other conditions, it can be with or without hypertension. So there's actually recently, there's a lot of, well not a lot, but there are several case reports of people who have recently started uh, cancer chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation who, who don't present with hypertension, but they actually end up developing press and the mechanisms are unclear why. Um, I, I, and then I just added this little tidbit, I think this came up a lot this is a really important one to think of in pregnant women who present with vision loss. So maybe a little note for us as residents. The pathophysiology really is unknown. There's kind of three main hypotheses. One is cerebral vasoconstriction, which causes infarcts in the brain, leading to cytotoxic edema or cellular uh, damage. The second one is failure of cerebral um, vasculature autoregulation, which leads to vasogenic edema. And then the third one is endothelial damage with blood-brain barrier disruption, which then also leads to vasogenic edema. Um, kind of a, I thought this was a, a good um, cartoon rendition of, of kind of the difference between cytotoxic and vasogenic edema. So vasogenic edema is actually what it sounds like to me. So there's disruption of the tight junctions of endothelial cells, which just leads to leakage of um, plasma and fluid into the brain causing edema, into the parenchyma of the brain. Whereas cytotoxic edema is an initial insult or injury to the cells, um, which then have uh, th their sodium potassium pumps stop working, for example. Then sodium builds up inside the cells, which drives a water gradient into the cells. The cells swell, but then that leaves 
the brain parenchyma with also a high ionic gradient, which then draws fluid from out of the vasculature into the parenchyma. So you get, you kind of get the same endpoint, but you have this extra bit of cytotoxic edema in the middle. Now, why, why is this necessarily important? So I actually found this really interesting with neuroradiology. They said you can see this depending on the windows you use in the scans. So vasogenic edema is easily seen with a T2 flare uh, with um, flare abnormalities or hyperintensities, and that's, that indicates vasogenic edema, whereas this kind of DWI diffusion restriction, um, it makes sense because it's water restriction. So if you have edema that's caught inside of a cell, it's not being able to move, that's why you get this flare or this signal abnormality. So that's indicative of cytotoxic edema. Um, so the diagnosis, we, we kind of already talked about, I, but in this slide I just wanted to point out that really these symptoms are pretty variable. So headache was present in maybe about half of patients, encephalopathy half to all of the patients, again depending on the case series, and then seizure was, was quite prevalent, so our, our patient never did show any signs of seizure. He never did get an EEG, but he never had any clinical signs of seizure. And then vision loss anywhere from about 40 to you know, three-fourths of the time. Um, yeah, and then the imaging, just to remind everyone, is the vasogenic edema. Oh, sorry. That, so in the radiologist's report on this, they kept on referring to it as atypical or complicated press, which I didn't come across much in the literature, but they said that there's some radiological literature that says if there's any hemorrhage involved or any ischemia involved, then this kind of bumps up the diagnosis from just run-of-the-mill press to complicated press, which kind of has prognostic uh, implications. Mike? Yeah. Yes. In the setting of this? Yes. Okay. Actually, this is a really good point. One of my discussion questions is this is a little bit weird that, you know, our patient has been in the hospital for five days, and then, I mean, his blood pressure had been training out nicely. There were maybe a couple of hypotensive episodes, but if this was press all along, press typically doesn't happen except for in the acute hypertensive phase. So the radiologist absolutely did say, hey, this, this does look like it could be some watershed zone infarcts maybe the press was there all along, although they, they said, especially the attending that I talked to, she said that it was really difficult for her to believe that the small amount of infarct that they saw was able to account for his no light perception in both eyes. So I don't know that we're going to be able to tell for sure, but probably a mixture. Um, so the treatment is just treating the underlying condition. Most often that's hypertension, but like I said, sometimes it can be withdrawal of the offending agent in the case of chemotherapy. And this can be quite significant in someone who's undergoing treatment for cancer and then has a press reaction. I mean, that's a difficult decision to make because even though in the name it says this is reversible, um, it's, it's not always, especially if it's complicated or atypical press. And in fact, studies have shown that up to 15% mortality range or permanent neurologic deficit. Um, especially in, condition, or in, in cases of atypical or complicated press. So back to our patient. So he continued to have his blood pressure controlled pretty aggressively, especially once we kind of ruled out, no, this was not a retinal artery occlusion. Um, you know, we kind of um, lax the, the restrictions on his permissive hypertension. His inpatient workup for the cause was really unrevealing, and he, he kind of went through the, the ringer. So we still really don't know what's causing his hypertension. At time of discharge, his vision was still only count fingers at six feet, but um, he was more, most recently seen in September. He missed a couple of appointments, unfortunately, with neuro-ophthalmology, but he was seen by Dr. Christensen, and with a uh, excellent refraction, he was 20-20 in both eyes. Um, his visual fields by confrontation were full, but he has not had a, an automated visual field done. That's it, so we, uh, we'll, I'll just kind of go ahead and end. I, Love to hear thoughts on uh, kind of this misdiagnosis of an RAO, especially if, if anybody had thoughts on anything they do differently or you know, was this brain attack warranted or not, but we'll maybe save that till after just so we can go through. And then we already talked about this first one. That was a great question by Dr. Petty, so that's it. Uh -huh.